Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's been about one week since Japan's smart lander for investigating the moon touched down softly on the moon, unfortunately in the wrong orientation. And we've been speculating as to what happened for the last few days, but finally, we have a much better idea of what's going on thanks to a fairly extensive press conference that was given last night in Japanese. So, Thankfully, some people have done some translation for this, but you know this is the final uh, plot of the landing using the tr the data that they delivered, right? And we now know that the orientation data which is being delivered right you know, after the landing is absolutely valid, and the vehicle did end up nose down with its solar panels facing to the west after tumbling on the lunar surface. But the reason for why that uh, happened, well. That is a whole fascinating story that we're going to get to. Yeah, so we have this amazing image from uh, Lunar Exploration Vehicle Number 2. That is the little spherical thing that pops open, designed by a toy manufacturer. And as we all know, toys get a lot of beating, so it's perfect to design something that's going to get dropped on the moon. What we see is... There's no rough rocks or anything here. Sure, the surface is you're rough, but there's no big pieces of terrain that's going to mess it up. We knew that we would have this gentle slope. What we see is the spacecraft sitting nose down on the moon. We can see a shadow pointing in this direction, and we know the solar panels are here, so it is in shade. You can see the engines up here, the little uh, thrusters here, the RCS thrusters for steering, and the large nozzle of uh, the remaining engine. Why remaining engine? Well, apparently the reason it touched down badly was because uh, it lost an engine. So yeah, we have this nice presentation that's all in Jap Japanese. And uh, thanks to uh, Tony over at NASA Space Spaceflight, uh, Space Flight, yeah, he had translated it into English using Google Translate. It is not a great translation because it is a machine translation, but it is much better than my Japanese translation, which uh, couldn't do this at all. So what their conclusion is, the landing went absolutely great up to 50 meters down. And in fact, I think they have a video showing some of the cross-range, you know, variation. So this is a spacecraft. As it comes down, uh, we, you see, okay, we'll go here. Yeah, so these points here, the blue is where it's supposed to take navigation images. And you see that as it does this, it makes corrections to where it thinks it is and uh, gets closer to the target line. And again, you see right here, and finally for the very last section, it comes down, makes these corrections, decides where it's gonna land, and yeah, this is where it starts to go wrong, right about here. You see it sort of waves back and forth and ends up down on the slope. So anyway, according to the team, the landing went absolutely great. They were able to maintain the required level of precision. And indeed, they were able to land within their target box, uh, You know, therefore qualifying the mission or one of the primary objectives of the mission, which was to be able to put down the spacecraft free of any debris. You can see this is it looking at the surface. Oh, look at what's this bit of debris. Definitely want to avoid that, right? Uh, <laughs> some of you know what's going to happen next, right? So yeah, they, around about, uh, well, 19 minutes and 18 seconds, the total thrust generated by the two main engines suddenly decreased to about 55%. So you see it like popping up and down here as the engines get turned on and off. And at this point, suddenly the thrust that it's getting drops, not quite 50%, so it's not a complete failure, but they lose almost all the thrust from one of the engines. Why? Well, they think that they caught this on the navigation image. This is the nozzle for one of the engines, the minus X nozzle. And so, of course, the nozzle is very important in taking the hot exhaust gases and you know, collimating them, focusing them, I guess, is the best way to think about it, so that you maximize the exhaust velocity. And without that, they lost the performance, so they lost... Um, you know, they basically, they were not getting the same amount of thrust. Now, at that point, the onboard systems did actually figure out something. <laughs> they figured out that they weren't getting as much thrust, and they switched to a different landing mode. Also, I love this translation. Uh, it is possible that some external factor has affected the main engine on the minus X side. I think it's highly sexual, which... <laughs> 
I, th- I think this is a translation. It's supposed to say, I think this is amazingly interesting. And it's just not translated correctly. But yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, I can't do this. <laughs> Um, so yeah, one of the important factors, by the way, they mention is that um, the propulsion system on Slim is it's a, blow, a pressure-fed blowdown system, which means that they have big propellant tanks, and then just before when they pressurize the system, they put in high-pressure gas into the space like above the fuel and the the oxidizer, and as that as the fuel is drained or the propellant is drained, that gas expands. And so what this means is that the pressure in the system decreases as they burn propellant. So you actually lose some engine performance. Now, the other version is like a regulated system where you have a high pressure gas tank feeding through a regulator to maintain the pressure above the propellant. This is a simpler system, but it does mean that you have to have slightly bigger tanks because you have to have extra gas at the top. And uh, you need to accept the fact that your propellant pressures are changing and potentially the mixture ratios. One thing they know is that the mixture ratio on the minus X side engine is always lower than the plus X engine. And mixture ratio is fuel to oxidizer. So if that's lower, that means less fuel, more oxidizer. And that may be significant as to why the minus X side failed. So now we have this section that explains exactly what happened after that anomaly. Now, this happened when it was hovering and taking images. And apparently the computer detects this abnormality and it changes the guidance rules to try to save the spacecraft. What it does is it changed the attitude slightly to try and control its uh, lateral motion. It continues its descent, and in fact, it can maintain the descent rate within the sort of limits that are set down up out for the spacecraft. Um, now, because it's lost one of the engines, there is a torque that is trying to rotate it towards the weakened engine. And that means it's having to use the reaction control thrusters to stop this rotation to keep the thing vertical. Uh, but that does limit its control authority. It is great that the computer software was able to handle this. If you think about, say, uh, Chandrayaan, it had a valve that opened in a slightly incorrect rate and it ended up going slightly slower than expected. And at that, after it came out of its uh, you know attitude hold, the computer software was just like, I don't know what to do about this. It could have landed it, but the software was not capable. Slim had the software and it adapted. So... It descends down, and in fact, its touchdown rate was a, had a vertical descent rate of 1.4 meters per second, which was slower than the specified requirements. However, because of the offset thrust, it was touching down with higher lateral velocity than expected. And so the spacecraft, of course, rolled. It didn't perform the pitch over maneuver. It did release the LEV-1 and LEV-2 at an altitude of five meters, but it didn't perform the pitch over to uh, transition to the landing orientation. And that meant that it sort of tumbled and ended up in its current orientation. So the after the landing, well, they note that there is no, uh, no power to the solar cells and they immediately carried out a set of emergency procedures. They start to download the data, turn off unnecessary equipment, turn off heaters, And uh, they also begin observation using the onboard multispectral cameras. And at about two and a half hours, or sorry, almost three hours after landing, they shut the spacecraft power off. Now, there's still power in the batteries. They didn't want to run the batteries down below 12% power because then it would make it very unlikely to restart once they actually got solar power. Uh, So they performed these imaging scans off the surface and the way this is, it's a, the camera is moving. Actually, it's a mirror which is pointing the camera at different locations. So they're able to get these nice images, which they're mosaicing. They planned to collect this area, but they didn't because the camera overheated and, you know, they were basically running out of power. We've got some another imagery, which what they're doing for calculating where it landed is they're looking at this uh, terrain in the distance and comparing it to a simulation. I believe we have a simulation here. This is constructed using digital terrain model that was collected by uh, Kaguya, which is another Japanese uh, orbiter. What happens next? Well, 
The, the spacecraft is shut down on the surface. They don't know that there's any damage to it, but they're hoping to get power on those solar cells and they will be hopefully able to continue multi-band spectroscopic camera imaging of the terrain. Uh, if that happens, if they get power, they will have until about February 1st when the sun actually sets at that location. And of course, 14 days, maybe the sun will come back up and give them you know, some more life in the future, but it's not guaranteed. It's definitely not expected. That is not part of the mission success criteria. The, net, the issue, well, uh, the, you know, despite having this issue at uh, 50 meters of altitude, it's uh, excellent that they were able to handle this and get it down softly to the surface. And I'm going to point out that losing the nozzle from a rocket engine does actually have a precedent in Japan, right? There is a spacecraft called At Akatsuki, which went to Venus. And it had almost the same kind of engine. It featured a nozzle, which was a ceramic, uh, was it silicon nitride? And during its orbital insertion to Venus, it also had an engine anomaly. It lost a lot of thrust and the vehicle went into safe mode and it was figured out that the nozzle had sheared off just beyond the throat. And that was ultimately attributed to the, a, a valve in the propulsion system jamming open and the propellant becoming oxidizer rich. Now, remember I pointed out that the minus X engine had slightly more oxidizer rich propellant? Maybe that is relevant. Maybe not. But, you know, this is the second time this has happened to a rocket engine of related design. So I won't be surprised if they take a good hard look at this for the future. So the two rovers that were attached, those definitely performed some operations. LEV-1, we know that it hopped multiple times on the moon, but it is currently silent. I'm not sure if that's because it's out of battery power or because it's too hot. Apparently, some people think that it may come back to life once its thermals reach uh, more manageable values. Uh, the Lunar Rover 2 has generated a couple of images, and maybe we'll see some more from it. They have an overall set of uh, success criteria. They uh you know they believe your know, minimum success was to sort of just like verify that they were able to reduce the weight on a spacecraft and make a lightweight thing they believe they have achieved all the things required for full success that is autonomous landing and guidance and a high technology high precision approach and spacecraft maintaining functionality after landing and the extra success is where it actually does stuff for an extended period of time on the moon which hasn't happened at this point so yeah that's what they were going for and uh that's what they got but it sounds like they think it's more successful it's not it's not perfectly successful but they are happy with what they've got we also get some great uh this is the navigation images going all the way down set together in one movie so yeah we do actually have a video we just couldn't download it in real time and uh I, I remember trying to do this or you know map out this approach in Space Engine and, and it's great. You can actually see this. Okay, see it's coming down. I wonder if we get to see the, the nozzle appear out of nowhere. <laughs> no, they don't show that by the looks of things. Yeah, uh, what I'm going to say, look, great that we've actually got some details on this. Again, I think we're going to be looking at that engine in the near future. And I'm hoping that we'll actually get some more science out of this if this thing wakes up and otherwise we actually might get some science out of the data that has already been collected. So that's the update on Slim. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.